So our last topic on kinetics <coughs> is just going to look at a couple other things that can control the rate of a reaction. Um, today is mostly conceptual. There, there's some math at the very end, but um, hopefully it's the easiest of the uh, three things that I have showed you in the unit. So let's, uh, let's take a look. So today, uh, oh, at home, make sure you've got uh, your lecture slides in front of you so you can see what they see. Um, we've got the return of Kelvin. That's exciting. Um, I'm sorry? Stupid potassium started at all, though. Um, yeah, we discussed last unit that Kelvin would be an awesome Halloween costume. What? Kelvin would be a good Halloween costume. Like if you were, like if you were Celsius, dressed as degrees Celsius, and then just put plus two seventy three, and then people would be like, "What are you?" Like I'm Kelvin, stupid. Um, so what I uh, what I like about this slide is uh, it just shows the uh, zero to hundred comparison on each of the uh, temperature uh, gauges, and Fahrenheit, of course. Um, most of y'all have probably experienced both zero and 100. Um, not zero if you've never left here, but if you've gone somewhere else, maybe you've gotten at least into single digits. But you can survive at both zero and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Celsius is a little bit different. All right, well, zero degrees Celsius is freezing. So that would be 32 Fahrenheit. You've definitely experienced freezing before, just not often. But 100 degrees Celsius, well, you're dead at that point. Because 100 degrees Celsius is the same as 212 Fahrenheit, uh, which of course, if I was like, hey, it's 212 outside today, you, the, the weather map just melts. So, um, and then Kelvin, you're dead on both ends. So, um, yeah, pre -AP. However, the magical number for Kelvin that you need to remember was what? 273. 273. So if you have forgotten, that Kelvin and degrees Celsius are 273 apart and that Celsius is always smaller, then um, make yourself a note because you'll want to remember that. At 273, that degrees Celsius is 273 less than Kelvin. I thought it was 273 more Celsius. Kelvin's always the larger number. Because you can have a negative Celsius, you can't have a negative Kelvin. All right, remember, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. No, Fahrenheit minus, I mean, wow, Kelvin minus 273 gives you Celsius. All right, so let's, let's revisit um, some diagram type stuff and take a look at what temperature does to reactions. Um, what I want to point out is that, as you already should remember, uh, making a solution hotter usually speeds up the rate at which a um, reaction will take place. But I want you to understand what's really happening when uh, the temperature rises, and more specifically, what's not happening. Um, this dashed line going upward represents activation energy. The activation energy is the amount of energy that the reactants must get to in order for the reaction to take place. It's the energy that activates the reaction. So in both of my diagrams here, I've got the same reaction taking place and they have the same activation energy. If you take a look at where that dashed line is shooting upward, you'll see it's at the same point on both graphs. It's right here at about the 120 joules mark on both of them. All right, it's just that dashed line is harder to see uh, because the graph's at a different temperature. If you try to identify the difference between these two diagrams, it's the temperature that is making the diagram look differently. Now it's hard to see on this slide because it's small, but if you print it or copied, you can see that the first diagram is taking place at 400 Kelvin, while the second one's taking place at 300 Kelvin. And that makes a big difference on the amount of molecules that are able to react at the activation energy. Because it turns out that in the hotter diagram, 
you can see that more of the molecules gain the energy required from that addition of heat to react at the activation energy. So on my first diagram, we have way more molecules that have enough energy because of this increase in heat to react at the activation energy versus the diagram without the heat or at a lower temperature. Now here's the big thing to be careful of that AP will trip you up on. Please realize that changing the temperature does not change the activation energy because you will get drawn to that answer choice on the multiple choice. Don't do that. These two diagrams are at different temperatures, but they have the exact same activation energy. does not alter the activation energy. It just changes the amount of molecules that have enough energy at that level to react. Gabby, you can swap when you have a moment. So then what can we do to change the activation energy? Well, we know changing the temperature won't do it, but we've got this vocab word that we've already mentioned in this unit, but you experienced quite a bit in biology where you can add a catalyst. And by definition, if you ask someone, hey, what's a catalyst? They usually tell you two things first. They tell you a catalyst is something that's not used up in the reaction. And they tell you that a catalyst speed or lowers the activation energy. So right there, we've found our entity, our substance, that can be used to alter the activation energy. So this is the same reaction. But both of these diagrams are happening at the same temperature. The difference is one of them is catalyzed and the other one is not. My bottom reaction there is catalyzed and you can see that suddenly the dashed line that was depicting the activation energy has moved from this mark up here to this lower energy requirement on the bottom one. Because by adding a catalyst, it lowers the activation energy and look, just by shifting that dotted line over on the bell curve without changing the temperature, suddenly we have a lot more molecules that are able to react quicker, which is why lowering the activation energy will make that reaction happen faster. But again, realize that adding a catalyst, again, don't, don't let AP trip you up on the multiple choice. Adding, an, adding a catalyst does not alter the temperature. There's no connection there, all right? And it will be an option. Adding a catalyst does not alter the temperature. Gabby? You were saying lowering the activation energy makes it faster. Right, it makes the reaction happen faster because now there's more molecules uh, at the proper energy in order to react. So, Speaking of catalysts, there's some conceptual stuff that you need to know about types of catalysts. So let's look at the types. We have heterogeneous and homogeneous. So uh, those descriptive words themselves probably already <coughs> clue you in as to what they are. But a heterogeneous catalyst is going to be one where the reaction and the catalyst itself exist in two different phases, thus the hetero. For example, if you have a gas that wants to react with another gas, one of the problems that these gases can run into is the inability to orient properly with each other to collide properly with each other because of the fast movement of gases that you already know exists. I have a dilemma. What's up? I'm supposed to have a sub right now. Is that delete? And they didn't show up? Uh, oh, it's because it's because of this period. They're gonna they're is this fourth? Are we yeah, in fourth? Yeah. Yes. The the front office is trained to have them show up after fourth period by default, which is stupid because you put it for twelve oh five, right? Yeah. So you just need to message down. Okay. Because Brad is here to come watch my actress duty, but I don't know what kind of duty. But you put a sub, it says a sub picked up the job, right? No, they canceled today. Oh. Just a few minutes ago. Do you want to go sub for the class? Yeah, come on. Um, <laughs> sure, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about fifth period. It's six, seven, eight, if eight, you eight, put eight, in and it says open, then the front office knows <laughs> that it's open. Okay. And I mean, there's, but I, but I they're not going to send anybody until fifth period. 
I know, it's done. Well, like I said, I'll wait for Brad a few more minutes, but my opponent's at one. So yeah, we'll get out here. Just make sure you message down and be like, hey, I thought someone was coming, but I, just. You know who it is I have to message? And I don't know the name anymore. They change all the time. I know they change all the time. Yeah. Bad overturn. Right, I'll, I'll just send it to, like, what's her name? The Caroline? Uh, Gazelle, yeah. Gazelle. All right. Um, so because of the movement of gases, they might have trouble reacting with one another. So we will get a catalyst to help them out. And it turns out that if you get a solid catalyst, this guy would be a solid, for them to attach to, it'll slow down their motion. They have a chance to be near each other. And now, oh, that was all on the camera. That's it awesome. Does. Dang it. Dang it. Um, and let them orient with each other. So what you'll notice here is for this reaction to happen, we have a solid catalyst helping the gases react. They're in two different phases, therefore it's heterogeneous. This process helped get you to school today because cars use heterogeneous catalysts in order to run. They have to convert carbon monoxide and other hydrocarbons in the exhaust into carbon dioxide and water. These are gaseous substances that I'm talking about that react in what's called the catalytic converter. It's just a part of your car, right? But it's catalytic. It sounds like catalyst, right? There's so much chemistry in your car. Anyway, um, but what they use while these gas molecules of carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons are floating around is they have a strip of platinum is usually the substance in the car that again, the gases can come and attach to react and then have carbon dioxide and water be given off into the exhaust. So anyways, that's where an example of where you might see a heterogeneous catalyst. Would the like, catalyst need to be a conductor then? So no, not necessarily because you just need, I mean, no, because as long as the gases can connect, it's not that the energy is being transmitted through the solid. Maybe the picture is misleading you. All right, it's an actual reaction between the gases. All right. Um, homogenous catalysts are more what you're already used to as far as catalysts go because an example is an enzyme. So you've learned in bio that enzymes use the, the lock and key where the substrate that the uh, enzyme is needing to catalyze, they must fit perfectly. Um, a lot of bio teachers use a glove as an example. The only way that you can make the glove work is if it's going on a hand because they have the perfect fit. Um, so homogenous catalysts work in that way. Again, enzymes are the biological homogenous catalyst because it's happening in the same phase. That looks fun, right? Okay. So this shows you a picture of the energy profile. Um, these are kind of similar to what we drew in the first lecture of this unit. Remember we had a hump to represent each step of the mechanism and the slow step was the largest hump and at the end of humps you found intermediates and at the end of the last hump you could find the catalyst. Yeah? Yeah. This class is awesome. Thank you. Um, not, 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 I mean my class, not okay. y'all. Um, it turns out in any of these reactions you can identify the energy of a bunch of different parts of it. All right. You can identify the energy of the reactants. You can identify the energy of the products. You can identify the specific activation energy, how much you needed to get the reaction started. You can measure the difference in energy between the reactants and products, which will be the change in energy or the change in heat in this case. So there's a bunch of different values that you could be asked to analyze. I want to point out though, in the way that this diagram is written, notice that the reactants finish, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. Notice that the products finish at a lower energy than what the reactants were at. Anytime that happens, that means that there was energy given off and that is an exothermic reaction, which should not be a new word for you. But exothermic is gonna be any time that the products have less energy than the reactants. You can tell that by looking at, these, uh, at this profile. So the EA there, is the activation energy. So as you look at this hump, you can see the amount of energy that the reactants have to gain 
in order to start the reaction because that's what the activation energy is showing you. There's a new vocab word that is, that is new to you called the activated complex, which is really what the activation energy is measuring is this intermediate step that the reactants have to get to to get the reaction rolling. Another way you could look at the activated complex is it's really a part of the mechanism, right? Because this structure here that exists at the activated complex is not a part of the overall reaction. It's one of those hidden steps that you would see if a whole mechanism was shown to you. But that's what activation energy is truly measuring is that transitional molecule. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that these reactions are reversible most of the time. So here's what I want you to imagine. You, you see it moving left to right, but what would be true if that reaction there was moving right to left? In other words, if you were just swapping the words reactants and products the way that they're printed on the screen. It would need, it would need more energy on the product. It would need more, it would need more of what energy? It would need a higher activation energy. So here's the deal. This is the activation energy, that point right there. So in order to get from the products to the reactants, well, hey, look at this. The activation energy is actually higher from the viewpoint of starting at the product location. You could actually calculate that number, though, because if you knew the activation energy from the original reactants, which is that distance there, and you knew the difference in energy between the reactants and the products, which of course is the distance from the starting to the ending, then to find the activation energy going backwards, it would just be the sum of the two, right? Because the distance from the products to this point, the way that this is displayed, is the sum of the difference between the products of the reactants and the original reactants and the activation energy. Also notice that it would no longer be exothermic though. Now, if you're going backwards, the products are higher than the reactant, so it would become endothermic instead. So again, if the products have lower energy than the reactants, exothermic. If the products have more energy than the reactants, endothermic, because energy has been put into the system. So it's a large variety of ways to analyze the different energy uh, rates, or rather the, the, identify the energies of the different parts of a reaction. All right, so our last topic is collision theory. Oh, I'm killing it. Um, so collision theory has to do with calculating the activation energy, which is what I want, one of the things I want you to be able to do is find the amount of joules, the numerical value of energy the reactants need in order to react. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide though because while that is the equation to find activation energy, it's called the Arrhenius equation. You might need to know that, that there might be there could be a question that just refers to the name of the equation used to uh, find activation energy. However, you can't use that equation the way it's written. You have to derive a different equation. So I don't want to waste your time too much on this slide. So let's take a look at the derivative of that equation. Now, Good news, you don't have to memorize that equation. It'll be given on your uh, sheet. So we just need to know how to use it. So let's take a look at a couple of the components of uh, the Arrhenius equation. We're gonna be using a natural log. If you don't know what that means, it can just be a key on your calculator as far as I'm concerned. It's gonna take K1 over K2. If you remember, K represents our rate constants. That's what we were calculating on Wednesday using the um, the method of initial rates. The EA is activation energy. That's what we're calculating. That's the whole point of the equation. Hey, look at that R down there. We've used a variable R together before, just not this school year. Um, the last place you might remember using R was with gas laws, but R's ha R had different values connected to things like pressure units. However, the R value that 
deals with energy is this number here. So this number is a constant value that you'll always use in the Arrhenius equation. However, you again don't have to memorize it. This number's on your sheet. So that is our gas constant of 8.314 joules per moles Kelvin for all of you people at home. It, it's not. It's, it, it's, it's like K not standing for something that starts with K. K is just the rate constant. R is the gas constant is what it's called. Um, and then we have a couple temperatures. Now keep in mind that degrees Celsius, as you've experienced before, is no good in most of the equations that we use. So Kelvin will be necessary. Um, the good news about this is it's just algebra. Algebra is a prereq for this class, so I'm hoping that we can just go through one problem and you'll just recognize past skills. So let's end with a problem. All right, so we have a situation here where it says calculate activation energy. That's the phrase you're looking for to know to use the Arrhenius equation. And now we can plug and chug, so work along with me. I know that I'm going to be finding the natural log. All right. Of K1 over K2, those are rate constants, so you're going to have to read through the question carefully. So let's take a look and see if we can find the rates. It looks like the first rate constant listed is the 2.41 e negative 10, 2.41 e negative 10, whoops, and that goes over the other rate constant, and you'll find a second rate constant of 1.16 e negative 6. Now, while this problem is straightforward, it could be a little more annoying because you know how to calculate rate constants. I taught you on Wednesday. I could give you tables and you could go through that whole process of finding your own Ks and put them in. All right? That sounds a little more FRQ-y to me, but um, you could, of course, combine your skills. It says we're going to set that equal to the activation energy, that's what we're trying to solve for. So I'm just going to call him X, because that's what we want to know. Over R, 8.314. And then we're taking 1 over the change in temperature. So we've got 1 over our T2, which is listed at 400 degrees Celsius. What number should I put into my equation? Six seventy three. Six seventy three. Four hundred plus two seventy three is six hundred seventy three. All right. Minus your initial temperature in Kelvin is five seventy three. Any questions with the setup? Anybody intimidated by the way that looks? The, uh, the initial temperature was 300, plus 273 is 573. The 673 was uh, T2, 400, plus 273. And then just simplify slowly so that you don't confuse yourself, all right? The natural log button, if you're on one of my cheapy calculators, is the third one down. So I'm going to go natural log of 2.41 E negative 10 divided by 1.16, whoops, it says LN, it's what? Alright, 1.16 E negative 6, and I'm going to get over here negative 8.1. Four, eight. 
going to simplify my um, difference of temperatures over here. You can type it in exactly as you see it. I'm going to go 1 over 673 minus 1 over 573. And I'm going to get 2.59 E negative 4. All right, I know it probably gave you a bunch of zeros to open up. I don't like writing those. So whatever, it's the same number as what you got. Stop me if I do something you don't like, y'all. Um, I'm gonna continue to simplify. Oh, it would be negative. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, wait, it is negative. Yes, you're right. I'm so, I'm sorry. You're brilliant. There, I said it one time. It's multiplied by Never again. Yeah, yeah, it's, well, exactly. So, this is multiplying by this. All right, the reason I wrote it weird is because sometimes y'all really like to see it um, in fraction form. I uh, got it. I don't, I don't think I like the way that you accepted that. Um, because if you remember the way that uh, you multiply fractions, you just get to go straight across. So really, this is going to end up equaling negative 2.59 e negative 4x over 8.314. When, when, when it's an equality. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. You need an equal sign between your uh, your expressions to do that. No, 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 no. Not if not if you're multiplying straight across. If you're multiplying fractions, it's this times this and this times this. If you're dividing fractions, then you multiply across because you have to multiply by the reciprocal. None of that's happening here, but some of you frighten me. Are there other questions on how I got to purple expression here? Ask if you have them. How did I put what in the calculator? Wait, well, hold on. I'm going to do the next thing in a moment. Have a good week, Kern. All right. Now we have an equality, and we can cross multiply to start solving for x. Again, most brains really like to see the whole numbers over 1. So what will happen there is if we cross here, we will end up with negative 2.59e negative 4x equals the product of the other cross, which is 8.48 times 8.314. I get 70.5 negative. negative. And then you just need to isolate x by dividing. Watch your sick figs, y'all. It should be a big number. Your temperature difference here is not going to play into your sick figs. I mean, your temperature values are not going to play into sick figs here. So you should have three sick figs in your answer. Here's what I get.
I like to throw the kilojoules value up there because it's very common for AP to want answers expressed in kilojoules. So just remember that your prefix kilo is going to be times 10 to the third. So joules divided by three gives you kilojoules. And that's the activation energy of this reaction. Questions? Nothing? Then all I can say is have a good weekend.